For those of you who don't know me, hello, I'm Jen Gorecki. I'm the CEO of Coalition Snow. I am the one who incessantly messages you in the clubhouse. You're welcome. It's great to chat with all of you. Um, and I'm really excited to be here tonight with Catherine and Allie. Um, Catherine is joining us from True Gear, and she and I have been talking about doing this backcountry virtual event series. Um, we've been talking about it for a couple months and really excited to be able to kick it off. Our goal with this series is to just build community around being in the backcountry. And Catherine and Allie, Allie, who's a coalition ambassador and will be facilitating tonight's session, um, we'll talk more about this, but this is not gonna be, um, what we're doing here does not replace any avalanche courses. This is not um, formal instruction. This is about building community, bringing people together and creating that space to have the conversations that we would normally be having if we were allowed to have nice things. But instead we all get to sit on a Zoom call, um, which also is pr pretty nice. Um, couple housekeeping things for the group. We're gonna keep you all on mute for the whole time so that we can focus on Allie and Allie will be taking questions throughout the session. So when you have a question, um, certainly you're welcome to unmute yourself and, and ask it, um, but just know that we're gonna ask everyone to be muted. Feel free to use the group chat. If you have a question sort of right away, you can pop it in the chat and then Allie can, can see it um, and we can take questions that way too. Um, we are recording this, so if you don't want your face on it, now's a good time to turn your video off because this is being recorded and this is going to go on the clubhouse. Um, I think that's all that I was supposed to talk about. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Catherine, Catherine from True Gear, um, our partner in this series and let you talk a little bit more. Sure. Um, yeah, first off, thanks everyone for coming out or showing up, signing on, whatever we're doing right now. Um, like Jen said, uh, my name is Catherine Donnelly. I work at True Gear here in Portland, Oregon. Um, and we are just beyond stoked to be partnering up with Coalition and their team of fabulous women athletes um, to just try and one, bring the community together and then try to, you know, take some of those barriers and obstacles out of the way for backcountry curious folks. Um, it's, I think we all know the backcountry is pretty intimidating. And I think anything that we can do um, as, as fellow females in the outdoors, as well as just uh, people who are passionate about the backcountry, um, you know, that's what Allie, myself and Jen are here to do is to help you kind of figure out is the backcountry right for you? And if it is, you know, what are the next steps? So yeah, thanks for tuning in. And I am going to pass off to Allie, who is going to be kind of leading the rest of the session. Cool. Thanks for having me, Jen and Catherine. And thanks for being here, everyone else. Um, my name is Allie Lev. I live in Portland, Oregon, but I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah. Originally, I grew up skiing in the Wasatch Mountains. My parents worked in the cottonwoods at both at the ski resorts up there. My dad was an avalanche forecaster. So um, I kind of grew up around all of this stuff. Um, I've been backcountry skiing regularly for about six years. I had like a, you know, hiatus in high school where I didn't want to do anything that my parents wanted me to do. So I kind of pushed all that stuff away and then found it again on my own. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few different things. I'm going to talk about, go over some gear, um, stuff that I take in the backcountry with me that I think is important and that most people, um, should be familiar with who to go with, um, general good rule of thumb and best practices for that, uh, where and how avalanches occur and what to look for, um, when you're reading your avalanche forecast. So, um, in starting off with gear, um, I'm a skier. Um, I'm not a snowboarder, but that being said, there's not a lot of difference in what goes in your pack. Um, when you're a skier and a snowboarder, you know, the only difference maybe are your bindings and that type of stuff. When you're a snowboarder, you're still hiking up in ski mode. Um, so I've got my 
coalition skis right here. So I have um, Dina fit bindings and the only the big difference that you're going to notice when you're uh, on backcountry skis and hiking up is that your heel raises. You can't just like go up the mountain on your normal um, resort skis because you need to have an alpine touring binding. And then you're also going to have some climbing skins, which um, look like this. And mine are folded in half and one side is sticky. Um, Originally, the Norwegians developed the climbing skins out of ski seal skin because one side is coarse so that as you're hiking up hill, it's going to prevent you from sliding down the mountain. Um, but now we don't use seal skin anymore, thankfully. Um, along with that, you know, you want to have a good pack. I have a 32 liter pack. It carries um, all my essentials, which are going to be mostly the same every day. If I'm going on a bigger outing, it, um, I might be adding more things, but the basics are going to be, um, collapsible ski poles, which obviously aren't going to go in my pack, but if you're a split border, they might go in your pack, um, folded up when you're heading down the mountain, I'm going to have, um, my beacon or transceiver, a shovel, and I highly recommend um, going with a metal or titanium shovel versus a plastic one. It's going to be a lot stronger um, when you're if you're thinking about when you would use your shovel, it's going to be in a rescue scenario and metal and uh, titanium is going to be a lot more reliable versus a plastic shovel. And then you're also going to have your probe. And all of these things are really important but they're worthless if you don't know how to use them. And I'm not here to teach you how to use them. I'm just here to tell you that this is what goes in your pack. Um, no amount of online education and reading, as Jen said, is gonna replace an Abby One course. So that's definitely something that you're gonna have to um, decide if you wanna invest in on your own. It's really important education. Um, so along with that, I, I would have eye protection. On the way up, I'm gonna be wearing sunglasses. And sometimes I wear sunglasses on the way bound way down depending on conditions um but i always have my goggles in my backpack um i'm gonna have a first aid kit which is pretty basic my first aid kit it looks really small it's a day kit but i have a lot of stuff in it um medication um anti-inflammatories bandages <clears throat> hand warmers that type of stuff if i'm going out on a multi-day trip like a hut trip or a snow camping trip that kit expands and I also think it's important to have a dialogue with who you're going out with. Um, you don't necessarily both need to carry a first aid kit. It's just important that in your group, someone has a first aid kit. And the same goes for additional items like uh, a multi-tool or zip ties. You know, these are all things that can be really helpful in the back country, but not every single person in your group needs to have them all the time. Um, plenty of food and water. Uh, navigation is really important. So whether that be um, relying on Gaia and you're downloading a certain area before you head out where you might lose service or traditional map, map and compass. But it's really important that before you're heading out with a group, you're all on the same page about where you're going, um, learning about the different slope angles and that type of stuff, especially if the weather is going to be a little crazy and maybe it's hard to see and that type of thing. Um, in addition to that, a helmet. Um, I don't wear a helmet every single time I'm touring, but it's important thing to have on hand. If I'm skiing low angle, really safe stuff, I typically don't wear my helmet. Um, and that's just my personal preference, but it is a good pre best practice. Um, extra layers, if you sweat a lot like I do, which is a lot, um, at the top of a skin, I oftentimes have completely wetted out my base layer. So I'll just sometimes swap it out and put on a dry base layer real quick. But uh, um, sometimes help with uh, regulating your temperature, it's better to just start out cold, which is not very comfortable. But you, once you start moving uphill, you're going to warm up real quick. Sunscreen. Um, and then at, depending on your experience and how you um, you know, transition through the backcountry, you might be adding different things to your kit that might include ski crampons, 
a whip it, which is like a ski pole with an ax attached at the end, um, which is beneficial in icy conditions, a slope meter, uh, avalung or an avalanche airbag, ski straps, coalition's got some great ones, um, duct tape, batteries, two-way radios. These are all additional things. They're not like necessary when you're starting out, but they're super helpful um, down the road. So with that, I will take um, some gear questions. Does anyone have questions on gear? I'll kick it off, um, Allie, and ask, um, what do you think about used gear for backcountry? Do you and and I know that this, I kind of already have my own feelings on this. I'm just curious about you. So there's like different pieces of the gear that that we need. Um, what do you think about? use gear since we know how one of the barriers of getting in the backcountry is that it's so expensive. A hundred percent. I think use gear is super, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, someone loved it and had a great time with it. And just because that person maybe bought a new piece of gear, doesn't mean that old piece of gear doesn't work anymore. Um, I think when it comes to boots, sometimes, um, that can get a little more tricky, but a lot of times you can just buy a new liner you know, when you're putting on some, someone else's boots that they've been sweating in and hiking and climbing in and skiing in for a couple of years, they're going to be fitted to their feet and not your feet. And uh, having uncomfortable boots is going to make your experience a lot less enjoyable. So I think buying used gear is really a great way to start out. I, if, you're, if money is uh, preventing you from trying new things, used gear is a great way to do it because what if you try it and you decide you hate it? And it's just not for you, but you've already spent all this money on a brand new kit. I mean, you can resell it, but used gear is a good way to start. And like I said, you can always get new liners for boots. Um, I see Josephine said that she had people tell me, uh, be wary of buying pin bindings. That's the only bindings I've ever skied with. I have the Dina Fit 2.0 um, radical bindings try and show them again so my boot here this is the pin i ride these skis inbounds too i don't own a pair of inbound skis i just own backcountry skis so i've never had a problem with um pin bindings at all so i, I can't really comment on non-pin bindings because i've never skied any other type of bindings uh, we have a question right above that from Lauren about, can you get away with a pack less than 32 liters? And then I'll let you go down to um, Albina's question. At yeah, the I absolutely think so. I think that um, the tricky thing is like how the sizing, you know, like my shovel taken apart, right? So this is the shovel part and the handle, like what's the width of your pack is your shovel I think you can definitely get away with it, especially if you're starting out small, you know, like you're not going to take three liters of water on, on a mellow day. I don't take three liters of water unless I'm skiing a volcano, I guess, but a normal day, even if I've taken a liter and a half, I rarely drink the whole thing. So less than 32 liters, I think is totally reasonable. It's just depends on the conditions. Like, are you packing extra layers into your pack? I don't know. Just depends. Um, what do you think about the new crossover boots, AT boots? I don't know. I don't, I mean, to be honest, I have, have nothing. I don't know anything about them. <laughs> um, I would also caution against used beacons. Yeah, I would, I would also cast caution against used beacons. Beacons are tricky too. You know, there's been, um, if you've kind of been following what's been going on with peeps, um, Black Diamond makes a peeps uh, beacon and it failed in the backcountry for someone that was uh, filming with TGR and they were buried in an avalanche and the beacon accidentally turned off and the guy just got really lucky and they were able to find him with a probe. Um, and they haven't really addressed it. They've come out with a new model, but they're not really addressing the old peeps problem. So yeah, I think Barb's totally correct in uh, used beacons are probably something I would avoid. And what they're, um, with that particular beacon issue, because I have that exact beacon, you can 
you're supposed to press down on the unlock button and then slide it, but you can force it. You can like not press down on that button and you can slide it up and down and you're sliding it from send to receive, um, which those of you who haven't taken any sort of avalanche course, these are the things that you would learn in an Avi one or even like safe as clinics, um, any sort of like beginner clinic on this, you would learn the, the different functions of a um, beacon. And with this peeps one specifically, you can force it and then it slides easily. So I think that's also like, don't fuck with your gear. Use, yeah, you know, it like like use, your, use it the way you're supposed to use it um, and take care of it. Take really, really good care of your gear because it should be an investment um, that you have these things for a long time. And then also it's meant to save your life. Um, do you have to get an entirely new setup if you've only been doing resort skiing? What's the least amount of gear a person can get away with detrimenting if they, you do? Um, because you, so a typical resort ski binding doesn't give you the ability to lift your heel, which is what you need to do when you're walking uphill. Um, even if you threw some climbing skins on resort skis, again, you, you have, your heel won't raise. I mean, you can certainly, um, I think also a good way to start, you know, you can be introduced to backcountry skiing by strapping your skis onto your back and going snowshoeing what, you know, like not at the resort, that's still a good way to give it a feel. You're not going to get the same feel of hiking up the mountain, but yeah, I see snowshoes, <laughs> jinx. Um, but you're still going out in the backcountry, and there's a lot of ways. I think the the backcountry can be really intimidating because, right, it's really dangerous. But there's, I mean, I live up um, in Portland, and Mount Hood has a lot of low angle terrain that's safe that I I would feel comfortable and have felt comfortable taking beginners to, knowing that like this is below 30 degrees. I know there's no risk of avalanche here, and this is a good place for someone to try it out and figure out if this is for them or not. Um, prior to split boards, we all had snowshoe. Yeah. Oh, that's you, Jen. <laughs> what do you think of using frame bindings with resort boots? Um, so ski, uh, resort boots don't have as much flexion as touring boots. And most touring boots have a walk mode, which is going to give you, um, just way more flex when you're hiking up the hill and frame. I've never used frame bindings, but I'm sure people do it again. I should preface all of this. I'm not a guide. I'm not a per, you know, professional, uh, ski instructor. This is just like something I'm super passionate about. And I love to share that passion. So I can only speak to my own experience, uh, rent a kit first super good thing to do. Uh, I definitely have taken friends out that are like, I'm really interested, but I don't want to spend the money yet. Yet run a kit like, uh, here in Portland, there's like at least five shops. I know REI will rent kits also, uh, pull recommendations. Um, uh, black diamond. That's what I ski with just collapsible ones. I'd say and the, you know, you're, you're going to use those, um, snowshoeing too. Um, long time writer here. I hate split boarding. Yeah. So Julia, I don't know anything about the K2 mind benders, but, um, Maybe someone else in here does. And if not in this, yeah, yeah maybe Catherine. I can speak to, I actually have the kingpins and I don't have the mind bender boots at this moment, but I have tested them. Um, I mean, if you're, well, first off to address the, it is, that country is a lot different than normal skiing or snowboarding at a resort. You will be spending a lot of time hiking uphill. It doesn't sound fun. I will sit, I will be the first person to say that because I a hundred percent have always been the one who's been like, I let gravity take me down the hill and then I get on a lift and go up. But backcountry had it's, it's a very rewarding process of hiking up. 
And then those, that 10% of downhill just means that much more. And it's also untracked in the middle of wherever you hike to and it's gorgeous. So it's a very different experience, but it's in its own way, it's rewarding, if not more rewarding than going to the resort. Um, As Jen just said, the, the, the saying, you're earning your turns. Yes. You know, you're really working for it. And a lot like of times two hours, two hours, three hours of hiking for 20 minutes of downhill. And I'd say that's a great day. It's and a lot of times you're going to be going, you know, as you gain your experience, you're going to be going into places where there's less people, which is kind of why I had stopped skiing resorts. Cause I couldn't handle the crowds. It just made me so anxious that someone was going to hit me. Um, and depending on where you live, maybe you'll start skiing some really big peaks and mountains and volcanoes. And that's all really rad too. Or you can see with your dogs, which is what I do a lot. Any more gear questions? I have one. Actually, I actually have two things to say though. So the first, I actually got frame bindings this season just because I kind of have to budget. So I knew I couldn't get um, boots, like new boots. And I already had a pair of skis that could work in the backcountry. So they get the job done. I'd imagine they're way heavier than a pin binding. So I feel like if I were with more experienced people that have a pin binding, I might be lagging, but they definitely get the job done. And I have a softer flex boot. So that probably makes it easier, even though I don't have a touring boot with the walk mode. But um, my question is, when do you need, um, what's it called, like an airbag in your backpack? Like, is that something that, like, I mean, I'm just a beginner, so I'll be going in very safe areas, but someone mentioned that I should get an airbag, and I just don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question, and honestly, I think that it's personal preference. I mean, I've been backcountry skiing for six years, and I don't own one. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if that means I'm doing it wrong, you know, but I think yeah. I'm not hooking myself off cliffs. You know, I'm a pretty conservative skier, even though I, I don't ski resorts really, you know, I usually make it to the resort a couple of times a year. So my mm -hmm. ski season's always spent in the back country, but I don't go out on high risk days mm -hmm. or I only go to places that are, you know, low angle. So, I mean, I don't know. Catherine, do you own an Avalon? I, I have definitely, I've had an Avalon and I've had an airbag before. Like you said, it, it, it does come down to preference. And again, it's another limiting factor of, of money. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it, those things are expensive and they're also quite heavy. The technology is changing every year. It's, it's kind of hard to keep up with. And once you buy an airbag, it becomes obsolete the next year, which just, kills me. Um, so I actually sold all of my stuff and I'm just using a normal pack now. Um, I think if you're going to kind of, it, it does depend like on preference, your financial ability to afford one. And then also just, you know, if you're going up and rot heli skiing Alaska every weekend, maybe okay. you could have one. You could probably afford one too. Um, but for the normal person out there, I mean, it's a, it's a nice backup, another, like one more thing that can save your life, but it's, I don't know. It's, it's a lot of money. <laughs> I mean, people uh, have been, back would... in, sorry, Jen, people have been backcountry skiing for years prior to Abby Lungs. Like I think about my dad or, you know, his friends and stuff, and they survived in the backcountry for years without Abby Lungs. That's not saying it's not an important tool, but again, it's, what your, what your level of comfort and financial situation is. And Shelby, I would say, and I would say this for everyone in this, in this group, not just to you, because I, I know you, I would a hundred percent invest in courses before I purchased a pack. So yeah. spend that money on an Abbey one, spend yeah. that money on an Abbey two, like go out and get the education and spend time in the field before you invest in a pack, because getting that education is what's going to keep you so much safer than a pack. Um, and, you know, a lot of what makes a difference on our safety is the decision-making that we have 
And so as Ali mentioned, like part of it is understanding the people who you're going with. And another thing is having that education so that you can make the best decisions when you go out there. So certainly um, the pack would be the last thing on my list. And I would have, you know, education, beacon, shovel, probe, good humans would be like, that's like a must for me. Um, and I think I just want to acknowledge what Barb um, has said that the Avalongs and the AirPag backs are two different things. They are different things. Um, the Avalong was essentially something that would allow you to have um, an airway if you were to get caught in an avalanche and the, and the airbags bring you to the top. They essentially float you to the top and they do kind of two different things because a lot of times when people die in avalanches, it's because of trauma. So the idea is to like get up and above and stay on top and then also not, and then, you know, not get, get buried. So they are two, two different things, but yeah. Any other gear questions? It looks like Heidi has a question about um, ski length. So would you go, you know, same as your resort skis, would you go shorter or longer um, for backcountry skis? Um, again, I don't own inbound skis, so mine are the same, obviously, but I think that depends on what type of skier you are at the resort too, how confident of a skier you are in the resort, because uh, a skiing a groomer is a lot different than skiing, um, ungroomed terrain. Um, so I think that I, I can't a hundred percent give you a set answer on that. Jen. Um, I would say that it, uh, Ski length for me depends on the type of ski. Skis are different. How much rocker does it have? What's the width? Like I would, I would think about that. Same thing with a split board. Like you really have to look at the design of a split board. Like is the split board designed where you can ride it a little shorter? Is it longer? And then also sometimes it's going to be personal preference of obviously something shorter is going to be easier to get uphill. And then, but it, you know, it might affect some of your performance downhill. So like really thinking about what your, what your, your end goal is, um, I think makes a difference on, on that. Um, and it, Josephine has a question here on collapsible ski poles. Um, if you're a split boarder, it's hundred percent a must because you're going to be checking those things in your backpack on the way down. And even like, you can't have them tall because then you'll hit trees and you don't want to hold them in in your hand so definitely collapsible collapsible ski poles for um split boarding is a must but ali i'll let you answer that as a skier yeah, i don't think they're 100 percent required um and you, that's something i would get used to i i don't think use poles are bad um but i will say my husband's a split boarder i ride with a lot of split boarders a lot and depending on where you live or where you ski, you might have a lot of flat terrain in between uh, downhill terrain. So a lot of times the people that I ski with that are split boarders leave their poles out on that flat terrain. So that's kind of like a learn as you go type of thing. Um, I think that's about it for gear questions. Um, next, I'm going to just scan over who to go with and where and how avalanches occur. So um, my, my general rule of thumb is the smaller the group, the better. Um, the more people that you are traveling in the backcountry with is more people that could potentially tr trigger an avalanche. So if um, we're going out on a day that we're going to be in terrain that's above 35 degrees. We're not traveling with more than five people. Um, and that's, you know, I, I think five is even a little pushing it. And that just is my personal preference. Um, there were some questions that I'd had when I did my takeover about skiing alone. Uh, I do ski alone often with my dogs but I only go to areas that I'm super familiar with. Um, and that means that I has a low angle. I know how to get back to the car, even if it's in a whiteout. And yeah, low angle is probably like the most important thing um, if I'm gonna be skiing alone, because if I get caught in a lava inch alone, there's no one there to save me. Um, and the, when it comes to gaining experience, I'd say, one of the best ways to gain experience is to go out with people that are more experienced than yourself. And that's probably 
sounds a little bit easier than it is doing, especially in this COVID time. But um, skiing is thankfully one of those things where you can still maintain a six foot distance. And um, social media in the clubhouse is a really great way to meet new people. And I think this would probably be a good time, Jen, to show people how to find people in your area in the clubhouse. And I'll just keep talking for a minute while you get that up. But I've met, when I moved to Portland, I didn't know anyone and it was super hard for me to find friends. And I met a lot of people through social media and I still go out with people that I've met through social media. And I won't do something super hard with new people right away. I do something super easy and just kind of get a feel for like their comfort level and my comfort level, learn about their experience, have they taken an Abbey course and that type of thing. But I find my best ski days are when I'm out with other women. So I highly recommend it. <laughs> so we wanted to, um, when Catherine and Allie and I met, um, we wanted to show everybody how to meet people. So this is the clubhouse. This is what's on your desktop. If you're on your phone, you're going to always look for those little three lines. I call that a hamburger. I don't know what you all call it. It's a ha I just call it a hamburger. Let's look for the hamburger. That's your menu. Like that's how you click through things. And you can find people who are close to you by clicking on members, and then you click near you. And this is how you, this is how you find people. So I live in Reno, and here's all these Reno humans. And this is a great way when you're in the clubhouse where you can connect with people. Um, the the clubhouse doesn't give us a way to like change this and like find other people outside but you can always you know go to like top um we have these topics where you know if you want to find people who are talking about backcountry you can come into topics well i just made this yesterday so there's nothing there but i'll post this video there um, but you can meet other people but the easiest way is just click on members near you and then you can actually like follow people or you can message them directly so that's how you can connect with people on the clubhouse cool um and so from there i'm going to talk um before we do more questions i'm just going to talk about like where and how avalanches occur so obviously we all know avalanches occur where there's snow but um most avalanches happen because of humans 90% of avalanches happen because humans trigger them. And there's um, as many as 45 deaths a year in North America due to avalanches. But that's not just because of skiers. Avalanches do occur because of snowshoers and snowmobilers. And that's like a huge lapse in education is um, those two groups of people think they're kind of like immune to avalanches, but they are definitely not and should get their own education. Um, so avalanches are most common on slopes of 30 to 45 degrees. That doesn't mean they can't happen in other areas, but those are the most common places that you're going to see avalanches occur. The best way to learn about slope angles is to buy, buy an inclimator. That's not something you have to have, but it's a really good learning tool um, to help guide you through your backcountry experience. So before I move into um, what to look for in the forecast, do we have any questions? No. All right. Well, so I'm going to um, now do a screen share and talk about, oh, you have to enable me, Jen. On it. Let me do it. Okay. Let me see. Okay. Will you try now? Yes. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. So how do I move this? All right. So every, um, every zone is going to have its own avalanche website. Mine is NWAC Northwest Avalanche Center, but you can go to avalanche.org to find your own. So when I go on to NWAC, this is my homepage. Um, and I can search by zone. So I'm down here in Portland and my zone is Mount Hood. So I'm going to click on that. 
And I check this every day, even if I'm not going out skiing, I still check it kind of obsessively because I want to know what's going on every day that I'm not even there. So the first thing I'm going to see is, um, the bottom line. And this is kind of like the most important thing to read right off the bat. And there, you're going to see this little icon and I'll talk about that a little more, but these little two exclamation points are telling me that it's a higher risk day. And so this information here is going to tell me kind of what's going on, what's happened on Thursday, where you're going to see avalanches, things to steer clear of and that type of stuff. And then I'm going to scroll down and this is like the danger scale. And this is probably one of the most important things to understand when you're reading about the forecast is understanding low, moderate, considerable, or high and extreme. And I'm going to just show you what the actual danger scale looks like. And I have this Google doc that I'm going to share with you all at the end, but it's going to show you the travel advice for each type of danger level, likelihood of avalanche, um, and the avalanche size and dis distribution, um, as stated down here, there is no level that's risk-free people die in low risk areas. Um, it still happens. None of this is like set in stone. This is just like the rule of thumb. Um, how do I get rid of this thing? So back to, um, the Abbey report. So it's telling me that below tree line is moderate danger. And above near tree line is considerable above tree line is considerable. So that doesn't necessarily mean I wouldn't go out. Maybe I would just change where I would go a little bit. So then as we scroll down, it's going to tell me what my avalanche problems are. There might be more than one, more than one problem, depending on the day. Um, right now it looks like just one, which is a wind slab. It's going to tell you, um, the type of problem. This is called the danger rose. So this is if you were looking at a peak, looking down and you could see every angle. So it's telling me that on the Southwest angle, this is the danger scale. So it's likely to happen in these darker zones. So this is like the size of avalanche, small, large, very large, historic, historic, like takes out towns, super rare, but it's happened. Um, and then this is going to tell me a little more detail about what's happening in the area. Um, it's going to talk about, you know, observations, that type of thing. There's usually a picture on NWAC of what people have seen. Here we have another avalanche problem. So this one's a storm slab. And this is saying below tree line, it's still possible that a storm slab could occur. And then you're going to have a little more detail on that. Then you can look over here. Here's an example. Test slopes can give you a lot of good information. This new snow has set up after or during a storm. So this is someone that's take, gone out and done a test slope and you can see where it fractured. Allie, do, do you want to spend a minute more talking about the rows? Because I feel like that's like such a help, like to understand what that, what the aspect elevation rose is all about yeah so um i'm trying to think like how to explain it exactly like the danger rose is trying to show you looking down on a mountain um from every aspect what it could potentially be like does that make sense yeah so imagine like this is how i see it in my head and Catherine, feel free to jump in if you think the way I'm explaining it isn't right or anybody else in the audience. I think of it almost like it's a peak. And so that top, the top little part, yeah. like that's the top of a peak that's like above tree, tree line. And then the middle one is near tree line. So that's like the middle of the mountain. And then you have like below. And so I think of it as like that little part is, and then it goes down like that. And what you're trying to understand is what is the danger of the avalanche in relationship to tree line? That's the aspect, but then also, um, I mean, sorry, the elevation, but then also the aspect, which is the direction. And this is where like understanding direction, like, are you on a north, north, south, east, west facing slope? What northeast, like understanding what direction the slope is on is really Im important 
One thing that I think is really helpful to train your mind and understanding aspect and using direction is never give people directions or accept them with left or right. Make, you will travel north and turn east. You will travel west and turn south. Like really start training your brain to use, you know, north, south, east, west. And I think that that's helpful. Um, and then also really understanding where you're at. So if you're in your home range, you probably have some different, um, landmarks, for example, those of you in Lake Tahoe, like depending on what side of the lake you're on, there's a pretty big landmark if what's east or west, right? Um, also north or south. So like thinking about landmarks um, and really understanding that aspect is important and then where you are with the tree line. Um, but I'll just reiterate what Ali said um, a few minutes ago that, you know, there's risk everywhere. And so this just gives you more pieces of data to make the best decision that you can make. Catherine, did you want to add anything about this? Um, sorry. Um, I don't think so. I mean, it's, this is where taking an Abby one course is really going to make, you know, connect the dots for you. They're going to really go through this and the proper way to approach this information on a daily basis. Um, and you'll find like, for example, NWAC, which is our local avalanche center, they put out reports every night at 6 p.m. for the next day. Whereas I know like in the Rockies, they put them out in the morning first thing for that day. Um, and then, yeah, like you said, it, it does take a little bit of training um, and practice to just kind of get that orientation back. Um, I personally, I, I think it's fun to travel with a compass and, and play around with orienteering. And this is, I honestly sometimes do it in my backyard, um, even though <laughs> it's a teeny backyard and I know every direction already, but it is, it's just a good practice to always know what direction you're going. And yeah, like Jen said, you're probably going to find kind of your normal go-to places. And for me, I always, I'm always on Mount Hood and I know, I, I know Mount Hood pretty well at this point to like, I can kind of look out and orient myself based off the other volcanoes. Um, I know not everyone else has volcanoes to work off of, but um, yeah, just left and right really have no place in the backcountry. It it just screws around and can definitely lead to some some pretty big mistakes and issues. So yeah, I would I would second that. <laughs> yeah. I think like, you know, understanding all of this, you're you're, you're not just going to read it and be like, "Oh, this makes sense," but just practicing like reading it all the time and and looking at the images and the observations like it's you know, there's so much information on these sites, like the weather summary. And then if you go up to the top here, you're going to have the weather forecast, which is pretty in-depth observations. NWAC, NWAC has it so that you can submit your own observations. If you've been out there and you've seen something crazy and you want like someone to know about it, you can submit it. And then there's an entire blog on conditions for each day. Um, you know, all of these sites, uh, or areas that will have their own avalanche sites. Like these people work really, really hard to keep us all safe in the backcountry, And this information is essentially free to all of us. Um, and it's a really important tool to help us all stay safe in the backcountry. And like I said, it's a, I think it's really important to stay on top of understanding it um, regularly, not just on the days that you're out in the backcountry. So I'm gonna stop the screen share. And I do want to just add a little note, um, and I think this probably goes for you too, Allie, but uh, speaking, like, I've been backcountry skiing for seven or eight seasons, pretty, because, like, I don't go to the resort. I spend a lot of time on the avalanche reports. I do it even on days when I'm dreaming of skiing and know that I won't be skiing. Um, I will never consider myself to be an expert. Um, and I continually have to look up terms and refresh and there's a lot, it's overwhelming still, you know, this is, there's a lot of technical information. It's 
just getting thrown on you and it's it's kind of hard to conceptualize as well sometimes and I just want you guys to feel like you know when you look at a forecast and you feel kind of overwhelmed or just scared or nervous don't let that shut you down um, it is a continual process and even people who are out there guiding and and getting these forecasts they would never you know it's a continual process there's always things to learn and build off of um, so I just, yeah, I know looking at all of this data and information online can definitely be daunting. Um, just remember that I think we're all in that together. So. Allie, we have a question here about, um, are Abbey courses necessary on the East coast because mountains are less steep? <laughs> I think that they're always important things to you. It's continuing education. I will like, yeah, well, Catherine. So I am a Vermonter first and foremost. Um, I would, I know there are avalanche courses provide or offered by a lot of different services and guiding companies. It's not, I, my family, and it, it kind of kills me. I know it's not net like, there's a lot of folks who backcountry ski and split board on the East Coast without avalanche training or the gear. I'm not going to say that's right or wrong. I'm just going to say, I don't think I would ever go out there without my stuff. Um, the, the mountains are just as steep, if not steeper than some of the stuff that we have out here. That is not the concern. The most, the biggest concern is the snowpack that they have on the East Coast, which is not very big um, or thick. They're, especially I think in years past, there used to be a lot more concern around avalanches, but now with East Coast snowpack, it just doesn't accumulate and build over the season like it used to. Um, but there still are avalanches. Um, in Vermont in particular, I know Smugs and Mount Mansfield have them regularly. Um, that said, they are not, it's about like a foot thick. Um, and so it's, you could get hurt, you, the chances of you being buried by an avalanche are much lower. Um, I personally would recommend taking a course and just being ready for anything. I think the backcountry can throw a lot at you and having every tool in your, in your backpack and every resource at your hand to stay safe is, is really crucial. But that said, a lot of folks you meet out there probably won't have it. So, and I think Catherine brings up a really good point, Ali. You've talked about it too, in terms of like, like understanding the snowpack of where you live, and like, so for Ali showing like this is this is like where we go for local information. Snowpack, you know, you've got your maritime snowpack, which is the West Coast. You have uh, your continental snowpack, which is the Rockies. You have the East Coast snowpack. I don't know what that is because I am an asshole and don't pay attention to the East Coast. <laughs> but um, they're really different. Like here in the Sierra, it's maritime. We know that like the highest danger for avalanches is like in a storm and those first 24 hours after a storm and then it diminishes. And that, but that's not the case for everywhere in this country or everywhere in, in the world. We also know that in the Sierra, like we tend to see av avalanches in spring skiing in the afternoon. So that's why when you're out spring skiing, you have to go out early in, in the morning. Um, so this is all this stuff is um, gone over in your Abbey one classes. And that's why it's so important that you do invest in those, in those courses. And Allie, if you want to just talk quickly about um, the snowpack, because you're in, you're in continental, um, it does make a difference and it might help you understand that avalanche forecast that you just referred to a little bit better. Yeah. And, and you might move. I, you know, I grew up in Utah, completely different snowpack than here in the Pacific Northwest, you know, here it's a lot more stable than Utah and the Rockies. That doesn't mean avalanches don't occur. We just have a completely different system. There's a lot more moisture in our air here, a lot more moisture in our snow. It's a lot heavier. Um, but to just kind of reiterate, like, yeah, you, maybe you're not skiing um, as steep of stuff in the Northeast, but what if you ever want to travel? What if we ever want to come out to the Rockies and, and you want to, you know, try some of that skiing, you know, it's just, you can't place a value on education, um, even though it can be really expensive. <laughs> but I do have some resources to share with you all. 
Um, I'm going to share this Google Doc with everyone so that you can have it. I know there's been a lot of information that we just kind of grazed over. Um, and it can be a little overwhelming, but this um, does include uh, links to getting your Abbey One. Um, know Before You Go is a really, really awesome resource that the Utah Avalanche Center um, started a couple of years ago, and that has a whole bunch of free online e-learning. And then there's also avalanche.org where you can find all of your local avalanche centers that put out their own reports. And they also have a little avalanche encyclopedia so that when you're reading some of these reports and you come across a word or a phrase that you don't understand, you can look it up in the avalanche encyclopedia. So here is that Google doc. You all are welcome to have access to that. Um, do we have any other questions? Uh, Josephine asked a question in the chat. How would you recommend preparing for an ARI one course? So um, when you like start researching it and signing up, they will have recommendations on how to prepare, but the most um, thing they'll say, like, you need to be comfortable traveling. Um, you need to be fit, I guess, is what some of them will say, but you also don't have to be a backcountry skier to take an Abbey one. I've seen people take it as a snowshoer, totally fine. Um, so preparation, I think is, I don't think there's a lot. Um, anything else? You would need, you would need to um, own or rent the gear, Josephine, because you would do some um, in, in, in a classroom. And I'm sure now like that's virtual. And then you would do other stuff in the field, which would include, um, you know, using shovel pro beacon. Although my understanding, I'm one of the older humans in this group. So when I took their the curriculums changed a little bit from 15, 20 years ago. Um, you spend a lot of time in your area one around decision-making and it's your level two that you spend a lot more time in your field and in, in the field. Um, I found a lot of value in taking both like having all those conversations about how you make decisions and then spending more time in the field to understand the like snowpack and how that it, it just has helped me a lot also I'll just be the first to admit I'm the most like intermediate backcountry split border like if you went out with me you'd be like good lord Gorecki you should be like 20 times better and I'd be like I don't know but I'll talk to you about like snow you know like snow science stuff so I think that um it's really like no matter what your level is or like how good you are when you get out there, it's good to have the education. And then um, the whole point is just to go out and have fun. Um, so no matter what your skill level is. Yeah, and I see what's the ascent speed difference between snowshoes and skins. I don't know, what's your fitness level? <laughs> you know, like some people just crush it in snowshoes. So it, I mean, I've definitely, um, skinned up a mountain with a friend that had their snowboard strapped to their back and they were able to keep a pretty consistent speed with me. I did want to jump in, um, back to kind of prepping for an Aerie one. And I actually was just talking to Aerie about kind of the shifts that they've seen with COVID and how they used to have typically one day classroom and then two days in the field or some sort of variation. And now what they're doing is having one day kind of that classroom part is now virtual. And they've actually found that it's helped a like a ton for all of the different ability levels because they've sent out the virtual class beforehand. So people can review it, they can kind of go over it on their own time. And then they can come to the virtual live class kind of prepared. Um, and they've seen that a lot of people are, it's kind of leveled the playing field. Um, so just so you know, you typically nowadays will get kind of that course curriculum beforehand um, and you can review that going into it. Yeah. And in the last, I think two years, they kind of restructured. So now it's Avi one companion rescue and then Avi two. And then from there you can move on to pro. Um, when I took my Avi one companion rescue was included into that education. So I don't know now if they include a companion rescue in any of Avi one, or if it's completely a separate, but if you want to take an Avi two, you have to take a companion rescue prior. And I just want to say too, I think that like 
I know for myself, like I find that I'm often like, I'm very intimidated to go out with people who are a lot better than me because I don't want to hold people back. And I don't want to be like the one who can't like go do all the things. And that's just dumb. You know, like it's dumb. Like you, there's tons of people that you can go out with who are going to be, who just want to go out and have fun. You, really thinking about like what the objective is. The objective doesn't have to be to like reach a peak and like ski an amazing line. It can just be to like go out and enjoy time with your, with your friends and, and with COVID, like you can easily social distance. Like I've been skiing with people that like, I don't invite people into my home, but I ski with them, you know? And I think that like taking the courses you can go and you can advocate for yourself and you can, you know, have a research courses that have good re reviews, do all women's courses, um, like with backcountry babes. Um, and just, um, you know, it's, I think, I think like, I just want to say like, don't let the intimidation factor get in the way of you taking control over your backcountry experience and don't let your skill level get in the way of you taking control over it because, everybody started somewhere and not everybody needs to just like full send. So there's, there's a community of people out there for you, no matter what. Yeah. And it's called the clubhouse. That's right. Um, so to honor everybody's time, it is six 30. So this was an hour long course. Um, I know that Allie has an announcement to make. Um, I just want to say before, I just want to say, Allie, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to prepare and, and put this together for all of us. Um, the next course, let me look at my calendar, is going to be on January 6th. And I'm gonna create that event in the clubhouse. And that one is going to feature Jillian and Whitney from Tahoe Backcountry Women. And we're gonna be talking about terrain, like specifically like route selection and terrain. You can, but before then, in between then and anytime, you can find Allie on the clubhouse and you can ask her questions. You can go into that backcountry topics and you can ask any questions or share resources there. So just because we're ending this session right now doesn't mean that this conversation needs, needs to stop. You can find everybody. And like I said, we'll be um, posting this video in the um, topic, the backcountry topic. So you'll be able to find it there. <clears throat> and so, um, Ali, do you want to make your announcement? Yes. And I just to reiterate, like, please don't hesitate to find me on social media with questions. I love engaging with everyone and we all were beginners at one point. So, um, I just want to support everyone in their, um, process. Um, with that being said, I'm doing a giveaway on Instagram for BIPOC women. So that means if you are a woman of color, um, I have a backcountry ski and snowboard, a uh, Gore-Tex jacket and pants and a $100 gift card to Coalition Snow to give away. The giveaway ends tomorrow at midnight. I'm going to include the link to the post in the chat. Um, so if you're a woman of color, um, go ahead and enter the giveaway. I'm doing that because I want to support um, seeing more diversity in snow sports. Thanks, Sally. And um, thank you again, Allie. And also thank you, Catherine, um, for helping to put together this structure and the description and planning and working on all of it. So I just want to say like, as someone, you know, with Coalition Snow, owning a small business and being in snow sports, it's so great to be able to work with people like Catherine and True Gear, who just like get you and like what you're doing and want to collaborate on things. Um, and it just is, it's just, that's, that's why we're working together because we get along and we're friends and we accept each other. And these are like not things that you would necessarily think are like a deal, but it's totally a deal. And so um, thanks Catherine for helping out with this and for always um, being supportive of all the things that we do. Well, thank you. Awesome. Thanks for having us, Jen. It's my pleasure. All right, y'all. Well, have a great rest of your evening. Thank you for all of you for being here tonight. Hopefully we'll see you on January 6th. In the meantime, have a lovely holiday and a safe New Year's. Um, get out and make some turns. We'll see you in the clubhouse and we'll see you back um, on the 6th. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you.